Good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone. Welcome to webinar number three of season three in our WSPOS webinar. I'm Xiaowei Liu from Singapore. And to commemorate the World Down Syndrome Day, which is actually the 21st of March, WISPOS is having two webinars this weekend. This is the first webinar, and we're going to talk about management of ocular problems in children with Down syndrome. My co-moderator today is Dr. Yair Morat from Israel, and I'm thrilled to introduce my panel of speakers. So the first speaker would be Dr. Kishore Valodi. He's a professor of pediatrics from University of Pittsburgh, and um, he's done an amazing amount of work um, for Down syndrome. He's the medical director of the Down syndrome center of Western uh, Philadelphia, which is one of the largest Down syndrome clinics in the world. And he was the immediate past president of the National Down Syndrome Congress Board of Directors. He has also got a podcast on Down syndrome. So look out for that. The second speaker is Maggie Woodhouse from the School of Optometry and Vision Sciences in Cardiff University. She has done an incredible amount of work in visual function in children, um, Down syndrome children especially. And um, she has invented a lot of things, including the Cardiff Acuity Test. The third speaker is Lavinia Postelaki from Belgium. She's a head of the Pediatric Ophthalmology Service in the biggest um, children's, in the only uh, children's university hospital in Brussels. And of course, um, um, the, my co-moderator is Dr. Yai Morat from Shamel Medical Center in Tel Aviv University. Thank you, Xiao Wei. Uh, Xiao Wei needs no introduction. She's one of the members of the Scientific Bureau of the WSPOS and a close friend. She's a senior consultant in the, in the Dr. Lu Adult Pediatric Eye Specialist in Singapore. The, other, the next speaker will be Elizabeth Connor. Elizabeth Connor is currently an ophthalmology fellow at the Pittsburgh Children's Hospital. Uh, and she did her uh, residency in the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of, uh, of uh, she did her residency in, in New Zealand. She's a fellow of the Royal Australian and New Zealand College of, of Ophthalmologists. And our and the last speaker, and our last but not least, needs no introduction. This is Ramesh Kekunaya from uh, the WSPOS. He is the director of the Child Sight Institute and Center for Technology and Innovation in the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad, India. Um, <clears throat> can I have the next slide here? Okay, so one of the most important uh, aspects of our webinars is the audience questions. Please don't hesitate to ask type your questions on the YouTube comment section if you're watching us through YouTube or if you're watching us through Facebook, just type it in your Facebook web, web page and we'll try to answer and accommodate uh, all your questions. <clears throat> At the end of the talk, we can, we can if, if any of the attendees uh, wants a, a certificate of participation or attendance, we can send it to you via email, just email us at program at wspos.org. And that is the final uh, comment. And let's let's begin with the show. Kishore, please. As Kishore is loading up his slides, I would like to welcome everybody. We have people from Sweden, Egypt, America, Argentina, Kuwait, England, Wales, Singapore, and Israel, of course the UAE, Brazil, Kenya, Indonesia, and Malaysia. Welcome, everybody. All right. Well, thank you so much. I'm so uh, appreciative of this opportunity to talk about my favorite topic. And uh, we will uh, look uh, get right into it with the, uh, with the history of Down syndrome. Just to kind of kick off this talk and thinking about World Down Syndrome Day, it was actually in 1846 when Edouard Onisimus Seguin in France first described what would one day become known as Down syndrome. That uh, name came from John Langdon Down in Surrey, England in 1866, so almost 20 years later. But for almost 100 years, nobody really knew what was the cause of Down syndrome. There were many 
theories, but all of them eventually proven incorrect uh, until 1959, when Jerome Lejeune, or potentially even uh, his uh, worker in the lab, Martha Gautier, uh, was the uh, one who really did the discovery of the extra chromosome 21 working in Dr. Lejeune's lab. Oftentimes her name isn't uh, given in talks, and I think it's important to include the fact that uh, women played a very important role in discovering the chromosomal basis of Down syndrome as well. All of the findings, including ocular findings that we see in Down syndrome, are related to the extra chromosome material from uh, uh, one more 21st chromosome. Most of the time, 95% of the time, that is uh, what we would call trisomy 21. So during meiosis, uh, the, uh, there is non-disjunction. So an extra chromosome 21 is brought into usually the egg of the woman, but sometimes the sperm as well. And uh, the extra chromosome material comes from one or the other parent. Sometimes it can be translocation type Down syndrome. This happens about three to 4% of the time. Usually we see this as a Robertsonian translocation, it's called, where an extra chromosome 21 is attached to a chromosome 14. This is important from a genetic counseling perspective as one of the parents might be carriers of this extra chromosome 21 material. And so because of that, uh, we... Uh, we'll want to check a karyotype or chromosome on everybody that we suspect Down syndrome, uh, because in, in many situations, three to four percent of the time, it might be that one of the parents could have a higher incidence of having a child uh, with Down syndrome if they carry a translocation themselves. And the last type, which is the least understood, is mosaic type Down syndrome. That's one to two percent of the time. Mitotic non-disjunction. So after fertilization, during division of the cells from a unicellular organism to obviously billions and trillions of cells afterwards, during that process of division, an extra chromosome 21 can sometimes go along in one or many cell lines. Now, the reason I bring this up is all of these types, uh, the current recommendations are we follow the healthcare guidelines in the same way, no matter which type of Down syndrome. So they all should be screened ophthalmologically uh, as you would any child with Down syndrome. It is the most common genetic condition that results in intellectual disability. In the U.S., the numbers are uh, 1 to 787 live births. That's about 5,000 new babies in the U.S. Uh, with Down syndrome annually. And when we look at the U.S. population, about 206,000 people with Down syndrome are in the U.S. That's up from 50,000 in 1950, so all, all, a little more than quadrupled uh, population in just uh, 70 years or so. There is an increased chance, we know, of Down syndrome with advanced maternal age, uh, but remembering that 75% um, uh, of infants with Down syndrome are actually born to younger women, and the reason for that statistic is because younger women are the ones who are most commonly having infants, and so therefore most babies are born to younger women, and therefore most babies with Down syndrome as well, so it's just a statistical uh, situation there. What can we expect developmentally from someone with Down syndrome? So as a pediatrician, we're going to expect it delays in almost all areas of development. Gross fine motor skills are certainly delayed. Cognitive, cognitively, if we do IQ testing, particularly in young children with Down syndrome, we'll find that they have at most a mild to moderate intellectual disability. So it is not uh, typical that we see severe intellectual disability uh, in people with Down syndrome. From a language perspective, we know that expressively they have more delays than they have receptively. So they can understand spoken language at almost an age appropriate level, but expressing uh, their, their, their thoughts, their desires can, be taking a little, can take a little bit more time. But then they excel in certain areas of development as well. Anyone who has interacted with somebody with Down syndrome, very commonly we'll see that people with Down syndrome are very personal, personable, very social in their engagements. And so definitely some, uh, some areas of excelling in development as well. And as we're thinking about in this talk, especially vision can obviously impact all areas of development. In order for a child to develop their gross motor skills to go roll or, or crawl or walk to go to an object, they have to see that there are objects in that area or fine motor in order to learn how to write and, and, and hold something correctly. Vision plays obviously an important role in that. And so it's so important that families are aware of the importance of getting regular ophthalmologic screenings as well. So the American Academy of Pediatrics has put together healthcare guidelines, most recently updated in 2011, although there is another update that is hopefully going to be coming out soon. And in that guideline, they recommend that all pediatricians should check for a red reflex, look for signs of strabismus and nystagmus at every visit. 
Um, and then immediately referring to an ophthalmologist with exper experience in children with Down syndrome, if there are any concerns with the exam at all, even in the newborn period, of course, we see a lot more congenital ophthalmologic issues, which I'm sure we'll be talking about today. But after that, if the, if the child does not have any uh, immediate ophthalmologic concerns, the recommendation is that they see an ophthalmologist in the first six months of life annually between the ages of one and five, at least every two years between the ages of five and 13, and then at least every three years from the ages of 13 to 21. So when I think about evaluating a child with Down syndrome and things that may be uh, important for us to remember, a clinician should always introduce themselves to the patient first. Even if it's a four-year-old uh, with or without Down syndrome, children will find themselves in a lot more comfortable situation when we take the opportunity to look at them and, and, and talk to them directly as, as the first thing. And spending, of course, some time playfully interacting with the child uh, prior to the exam. Everybody on this call who, who does vision exams knows that you, if once you've lost the child and they're crying and screaming and closing their eyes, it's almost impossible to get a great eye exam, let alone any other part of the exam as well. So playful interaction in the beginning is of course very important. And then engaging every individual patient as is developmentally appropriate for them specifically. We know that people with Down syndrome can have a wide range of speech skills. Some can be completely nonverbal. Some can have a full sentence structure and understand and converse with you just like any other child. So it's very important to uh, address them in the way that is developmentally appropriate for them. And like we were saying, even though they may not be speaking verbally, receptively, we have to understand that they probably many times do understand what we were saying, even if they're not able to uh, say something back to us. This is something that I think is very challenging for a lot of people who aren't used to working with somebody with Down syndrome. It does take them a little bit longer from a processing perspective when it comes to language. So, so we want to give them time to process the thoughts and then reply. So don't immediately ask them a question, oh, how's school going? And if they don't reply within a second, we think that they didn't hear and we go on to something else. Give them a few moments to, to process the question and then reply. And then, of course, uh, we know that hearing loss is also more common in people with Down syndrome. So if needed, whatever communication aids are, are required should also be used uh, in people with Down syndrome. And then lastly, we want to make sure we always involve the parent, the caregiver, a support person as necessary. I want to make sure that we know about some words and phrases that we want to avoid so that we don't uh, unnecessarily make families upset with us as their physicians. With There are certain phrases that can trigger families um, uh, to think of us uh, differently as, as providers. So we want to avoid things like suffers from Down syndrome. And when we look at the data, people with Down syndrome, when they do self-surveys, don't feel like they are suffering from anything in their condition. In fact, they're more often happier with their lives than even we are. And so I think avoiding that term suffers with Down syndrome. I always recommend avoiding the term normal. Uh, normal has an intonation then the person with Down syndrome is abnormal. And so, of course, we don't want to send that kind of uh, thought process there. We want to avoid labeling a child with their diagnosis. So saying somebody is a Downs is a labeling process. And we want to avoid that as well. Uh, sometimes we say things and we think, oh, this is something that would be endearing to the family, but it's not. If you say, oh, I just love Down's kids, that's a, a phrase that makes it seem like, well, I don't care about your child's individual personality. I just love all people with Down syndrome, which is, of course, not what you're trying to say, but avoiding those types of phrases uh, is important to over, avoid overgeneralizing. Like this, all people with Down syndrome are. Sometimes people will fill that in with something like, all people with Down syndrome are happy. But that's not true. The more you work with people with Down syndrome, they have the gamut of emotions. They're sad. They're angry. They have all the emotions that we do. And so to overgeneralize what emotions they have uh, can be also somewhat offensive to families as well. I typically avoid the term dysmorphic. Of course, the, the base root of that word means bad shaped. And I don't think people with Down syndrome are bad shaped. So I like to avoid that term. You might, as an ophthalmologist, you might say something more along the lines of describing what you see, slanted palpebral fissures, brush field spots, epicanthal folds. You can describe those things without using the term dysmorphic. We, of course, are uh, moving far, far away, hopefully, from the term mentally retarded that has a lot of negative connotation to it in the Down syndrome community. So definitely good to avoid that. So what should you say? We always recommend using what we call people first language. So something like many children with Down syndrome. So they start as a child 
but their diagnosis comes second. So many children with Down syndrome can have intellectual disability is, is, is a phrase that would be better than some of the other things that we had just talked about. And last slide I want to just share with you um, is, uh, you know, glasses use is, a, of course, a big challenge. My brother has Down syndrome, as you heard. I remember when he was a child and I would have to duck when my parents would put the glasses on him because he would throw them at, you know, usually they would come at me. So we want to find glasses, uh, st strategies that work for the children to be able to wear them. Very important to find frames that really fit lower down on the nose. As we know, they have many times a flat nasal bridge. So typical childhood glasses may not fit their face as well, may push up against their eyes and eyelashes, which is a problem in themselves. And so, so trying to find uh, these types of frames, these are a couple of different options that we have here in the US, I'm sure you have where you are perhaps even online. Tomato is the first one I'm looking at there. And then the second one is Air, what's called Aaron's World frames. They, they fit a little bit lower on the nose bridge. Patience and persistence are so important that the family not lose their, uh, their, their cool, not to get frustrated with the child if they're not wearing their glasses. We talk about starting with very frequent rewards. 30 seconds, you wear your glasses, the alarm goes off, the buzzer goes off, the child gets a reward. And then as they can do 30 seconds, go to 45 seconds, go to a minute, go to two minutes, and gradually increasing that time to get the reward once they understand the concept. I always find the siblings are a very good uh, motivator for children and even especially children with Down syndrome. Even if the sibling doesn't wear glasses, giving that sibling a reward for pretending to wear the glasses that the child is supposed to be wearing, you know, the, the, the sibling puts it on and you give them the M&M or whatever to treat the child was going to get. And that makes the motivation for the child with Down syndrome even greater to see their sibling getting the reward that they want and staying positive, we talked about. And then I just wanna give you this last bit of information. This is our uh, uh, slide that gives you uh, helpful websites, our contact information at the Down Syndrome Center. And also we have a podcast that we have that talks about all types of issues related to Down syndrome, which you can listen to yourselves, share with your families. It's found on all the major platforms. Uh, so, so feel free to check that out. Um, and uh, we have uh, an episode or two on ophthalmologic issues as well that Dr. Nischel did for us. So uh, at this point, I will go ahead and stop sharing. And uh... thank you. Thank you, Kishore, for that really enlightening talk. Uh, while Maggie loads on her slides, um, I just wanted to, uh, to ask you a question. So there's an audience uh, who asked, how important is molecular evaluation for a patient with clinically obvious Down syndrome and does it influence your management? Yeah, so that's a great question. So all children with Down syndrome should have a karyotype chromosome analysis done. They're, they're typically, not certainly they don't need a large genetic evaluation, microarrays and more expensive uh, testing. But the reason for the karyotype is to uncover whether they have translocation type Down syndrome. So uh, if they do, then it's a good idea to have the children, the parents see a genetic counselor themselves, because it's possible they could be carrying that translocation and have a higher chance of having babies in the future with Down syndrome. So that's why it's important. Uh, Maggie, you are muted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Can yeah. you all hear me now? Um, yes, we can. I, I just want to say how much I enjoyed Kishore's um, introduction there because it was exactly what I teach our undergraduates about terminology and all this sort of thing. And it was just so confidence boosting to know that, that I'm getting it right, uh, that you, you feel um, exactly the same. So I will just start my, there we are. Okay, so um, I've been asked to talk about uh, features of cerebral visual impairment in Down syndrome. This is a piece of work uh, that my colleagues and I did uh, fairly recently. Um, CVI, as we know, is an umbrella term covering an enormous range of defects that are due to the brain, not ocular. And it can range from absolutely no sight at all, right the way through to some 
fairly mild perception problems with good vision. And it's that end of the spectrum that I want to talk about. The sort of CVI we're discussing here um, occurs associated with good visual acuity, but it is what the psychologists would term visual processing deficits or visual perceptual problems. And these were first identified by within, within the vision community by Gordon Dutton. And he developed an inventory of questionnaires or a questionnaire um, of 51 questions to tease out as many of the problems that a child might have. Each question starts, does your child, and is followed by a description of behavior or a scenario. And parents answer one of these four, never, rarely, sometimes, often, or always. What I've done for this analysis is only given you the positive results. That is the number of either often or always each child um, or, or parent of each child has ticked so that a child who has every possible problem in the questionnaire would have 100%. Uh, we only took the percentage of the number of questions that were applicable to a child because sometimes, especially for young children, some of the questions don't apply. So we recruited or we, we sent out 221 questionnaires to children who had attended my clinic for children with Down syndrome um, in the previous two years. And we got 81 returns, so a response rate of 31%. So if we just look at the number of positive responses from each child in increasing order, no child had no visual problems, visual perceptual problems. I must stress that we're not talking visual acuity or, or anything like that. Some children had just 2%, very few. The largest percentage was 76%. And as you can see, every possible score between is represented. So the problem we have is that the distribution doesn't lend itself to a cutoff so that we can say these children don't need any attention, but these children do. There's nowhere that we can see a break in that distribution. What research has also done is taken five of the questions of that questionnaire to use as a screening tool. And this has been validated for typical children. Um, and the screening tool is three out, the criterion is three out of five questions with a positive score is taken to mean the child is suspected of CBI and needs fuller investigation. And when we do that for children with Down syndrome, the children who were picked up by the screening tool are shown in red, and the children who were not were shown in black. And as you can see, it doesn't really help us because there's a mixture at almost all levels between children who pass the criterion and children who fail. So there's a great deal more work needs to be done. First of all, um, we need to determine whether the screening tool is useful for children with Down syndrome, whether we need another whether we need a screening tool at all for children with Down syndrome. There's a lot of work around why, what is it that causes these problems in children. But what I want to go through now is what sort of problems parents are responding to in children with Down syndrome. Now, what I'm not going to do is go through 51 individual questions. What I'm picking out are the questions that 
give us the most common answers and are relevant to us as eye care practitioners. So the most common issue that parents report is yes to does your child have difficulty walking downstairs and does your child find uneven ground difficult to walk over? When parents describe that, they often tell you something like, I don't think my child's got depth perception because the children behave as if they don't know whether a step is up or down. And when they're walking on uneven ground, they don't know whether they need to lift their foot up higher or lower for the next step. But this has nothing to do with seriopsis. Plenty of these children that have this issue have got perfectly normal stereopsis. And conversely, there are children with no stereopsis who don't have this mobility issue. So this is something quite separate. This is a difficulty in the parietal lobe, we assume, um, in combining stereopsis or other depth cues with mobility. And this is useful for you to remember, because in clinic, if you can determine this as the most common um, issue, it's worth then going through with a parent whether there are any other issues of cerebral visual impairment. And the way to do this, you can ask the parent, but sometimes parents don't think this is relevant to an eye exam. So sometimes they don't volunteer this information. So the best thing you can do is somewhere between the waiting room and your clinic room, put a change of flooring, put a different color floor between the two on the route the child has to take, paint a rug. And what you find is that children that have this issue will walk along quite happily and then hesitate when they get to the boundary. Or they will simply walk round if you've just painted a square on the floor. And that's a very useful observation to make because that is a lead in. I noticed your child stopped there uh, for you to start questioning parents and start explaining to parents that you're ready to listen to, to all of the other things that their child uh, might show as unusual behaviours. And then another one that's very common and that is directly relevant to our examination is the question, does your child have difficulty seeing things that are moving quickly, such as small animals? And this means, if this is a yes, that children are not processing movement appropriately. It's part of a dorsal stream dysfunction that they are not good at judging movement. So if you make a sudden movement towards the child during your examination, for example, coming towards them from across the room or diving towards them with your hand or an occluder to cover one eye, the child won't see that coming and they will react. Either they will dive away from you or they'll get very distressed, or some children will defend themselves by hitting out at you. And of course, when that happens, we are inclined to write uncooperative and even worse, challenging behaviour, when really all the child is telling you is they didn't see you coming. And quite frankly, you deserved a punch on the nose because you didn't warn the child that you were coming. And then the next common one is, does your child have difficulty seeing something which is pointed out in the distance? 
Um, this is tackling the issue of can a child pick out a target from an array? Because when you look into the distance, there's lots and lots going on because your whole visual field is filled with objects and the child cannot see more than one object at once, can't find something in an array. And this is also the reason why they sit close to the TV, so that the TV blocks out their peripheral vision and they can concentrate better. So what this means is if your clinic room is very busy, it's full of instruments here, there and everywhere and pictures on the wall, the child is going to be very uncomfortable because they're being a bit overwhelmed by the activities there. And they may find it extremely difficult to focus on what you want them to look at or what you want them to do. And again, in a similar vein, a common question that answered yes is does your child have difficult behavior in a busy supermarket or shopping center? This is a child, a similar issue, just getting totally overwhelmed by too much information, cannot make sense of all the information at once, and therefore the child gets extremely distressed and throws a tantrum. So when you're in a busy clinic and you've got all these things around the child and the child's finding it difficult to focus and you then introduce a bunch of medical students to observe, you're simply making the matter worse. So what can we do? Well, very similar to Kishore's list of how we confront a child with, with Down syndrome. We listen to the parent, first of all, because it's the parent who will report difficulty with visual processing. Take time to get to know the child first so that you know how best the child will respond. Move slowly and show the child what you are going to do before you do it. Make your room as distract, sorry, distraction free, it might be distraction free as well, distraction free as possible. And if you can, I know we all have to teach, but try and avoid too many people in the room, or at least don't expect the child to concentrate if you've got a distractible room and other people in the room and ask simple things of the child. If the child struggles with overload of information or can't find things in an array, they're going to find crowded visual acuity difficult. And we love crowded acuity, don't we? We are obsessed by crowded acuity, but a child might struggle to see the pictures simply because they're crowded. And the child might tell you the first picture because there's less crowding at one end and then just simply stop. And a child, of course, won't tell you that they can't manage that because there's too many pictures there. A child will behave in a way that you interpret as misbehave. And the other thing that we got for again from Kishore's introduction, that children are very personable and they are very social and they are very self-aware. Children with Down syndrome know that they're not very good at stuff. So if you confront them with something like this that they struggle with, all you're doing is proving to them how rubbish they are. But 
If you switch to this, to single presentations, you may very well find that the same child will suddenly engage because this is easy. I can do this and actually start to enjoy it. So we just need to think a bit creatively when we're dealing with children with Down syndrome who might very well have CVI. We also need to explain, obviously, to parents that their child, when they're refusing to come downstairs, is not being naughty. They've got a genuine difficulty with this. And finally, we need to be very, very careful that we don't misinterpret a child's behaviour. Of course, a child with Down syndrome can be naughty. All children can be naughty. I was very naughty when I was little, and I'm sure most of you were as well. But first of all, think, what am I doing wrong? Am I giving this child more than they can cope with? And put that right before you start to think the child is simply misbehaving. So i just like to give credit to my co-authors of the paper here and thank you Mary very much for your attention. Now if I can just carry on, Yaya has asked me to say something about some of the other work that we've well, done. Maybe we will speak about that in, in the end because we're way over. Fine, here. that's okay, fine, oh, we won't, so okay. We'll yeah. the that's lovely. So thank you so much. And I would like to, da, to uh, introduce Lavinia Apostolace from Belgium, who is going to speak with us about optic nerve dysfunction in Down syndrome. Please. Yeah, hello everyone. Um, I am so happy to be here and especially to speak after Maggie. That is a, really a, an inspiration for me when I start uh, to uh, work with uh, children with Down syndrome. So thank you. Um, I will speak about the abnormalities of the optic nerve in Down syndrome. So, as you all know, um, ocular abnormalities are often described in Down syndrome. And some of those, like uh, brush field spots, um, oblique palpebral fissures, uh, are, have no impact upon the visual acuity, while others, like uh, strabismus and amblyopia, anisometropia, hypoaccommodation, um, refractive errors may be factors for their decreased visual acuity. And some other anomalies like cataracts, keratoconux, uh, which are described mostly at the anterior segment. What is very interesting is that the posterior segment of the eye in Down syndrome is less described in the literature. Uh, when compared with the anterior segment, uh, more visible or more, more accessible. So maybe because uh, the posterior segment, segment is more normal or because the posterior segment is more difficult to examine uh, with a standard mean uh, of ophthalmology like direct or indirect ophthalmoscope. Um, since when the uh, fundus imaging and photographs become available in ophthalmology, um, one feature uh, with regard to the optic nerve, which was described by Williams in 1973 and uh, afterward in numerous publications, was an increased number of vessels crossing the disc margin. In some series uh, and case reports, um, Author described optic disc elevation, either by edema, true edema, or pseudoedema and optic disc truscence. Uh, in some um, studies, sporadically, they mentioned that the optic disc is tilted with crushed and pale or peripapillary atrophy. And uh, in a, a study of Fearson, hypoplasia was seen in 10% of children with Down syndrome based on double ring sign. A study on a large uh, population of, with Down syndrome, uh, based on their medical charts, uh, found 14% of animals optic nerve. The same was for the retina and choroid, 
when except uh, the retinal detachment, which may cause to, be caused by uh, autotraumatic uh, lesions, the what other uh, anomaly described were probably sporadically and coincidental. However, um, recent optical currents uh, tomography studies show that uh, the posterior segment have some subtle abnormalities like increased retinal and macular sickness or increased sickness of the neural retina. In our hospital, we have a multidisciplinary consultation uh, of children with Down syndrome. And we follow more than 100 patients and I followed them for past 10 years. So um, I was able to gather um, good quality fundus images in both sides from 50 children with Down syndrome. And we compare some morphological parameters of the optic nerve head with 52 controls. I have to mention that these controls were formed by children who visit our department for strabismus and refractive problems. So the strabismus, strabismus was similar between the groups, although in children with Down syndrome, the strabismus was fine in almost 50%. So, um, and the refractive errors in terms of spherical equivalent was also similar because the selection of the group. And we found that uh, the optic disc was uh, smaller in children with Down syndrome when compared to controls. And we based that on the largest disc to macula to disc diameter ratio, which means how many discs we can oppose between the disc center and the fovea in a patient. And we know that if we can oppose more than three and a half, four discs, we may speak about optic disc hypoplasia. And also an, another indirect sign was a smaller cap to disc ratio found in children with Down syndrome when compared to controls. And in our series, the double ring sign was present in 8%. The optic disc was also found uh, more often malinserted and in more often more oval or with irregular shape or torted or tilted than in controls. Questions of various type like scleral or choroidal question and various location, temporal below the disc or as a form of halo was also more, were also more prevalent in children with Down syndrome as you see here a panel of images with some of these uh, anomalies. And also the peripapillary atrophy and pigment anomalies were found in 30% of children with Down syndrome and only sporadically in controls. Another interesting finding was um, a tessellation of the fundus. Tessellation is a specific change in the appearance of the fundus where hyperpigmented and hypopigmented areas alternating the tigroid pattern. And it is often associated with myopia. And here in these images, I illustrated two children with Down syndrome, uh, high myopia and tessellated fundus. What was interesting um, is that if in controls, the tessellation was almost exclusively present in myopia and astigmatism, in children with Down syndrome, the tessellation, especially peripapillary, as you see here in these images, was also present in hyperopia, hyperopia, astigmatism, or emetropia. And finally, we uh, analyze the visual acuity and we try to correlate some factors which may decrease visual acuity uh, in our patient and controls. The, the visual acuity was lower in children with Down syndrome when compared to our controls, even though strabismus and isometropia and refractive errors were similar between the groups. And furthermore, the visual acuity was not correlated with the disc size with the presence of the questions or the tellated fundus, which means that this optic nerve and fundus anomalies that uh, I described are not pathologies, but more that uh, anatomical developmental abnormalities, which have little or no impact on the visual equity. Um, a parenthesis, what I want to make here is not on the slide, but in our series, the children who, who had a hyper accommodation, um, the vision was similar with those with Down syndrome and normal accommodation. And this is because um, all our children was well equipped with uh, bifocal or multifocal glasses. 
thanks to Maggie and her work. Yeah, so the visual acuity was, uh, was good, similar between the groups. Um, however, the visual acuity was found significantly decreased in children with Down syndrome and nystagmus when compared with children with Down syndrome and without nystagmus. Nystagmus was found in 30% uh, of the children in, in our series. And it is very interesting to, to know in some cases, the nystagmus was associated with strabismus. And in some cases, we don't really know the explication. But I think that the a low visual acuity precedes in most of the cases the nystagmus, like high amyotropia, high myopia, etc. But it, it will be a very interesting discussion to know why the nystagmus is so frequent and so prevalent in Down syndrome. I know that Maggie just saw a paper about it, so I'm sure this could be an interesting discussion. So I want to thank you all yeah, for the attention and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lavinia. So maybe um, can we have uh, Maggie Woodhouse to comment a little bit about the accommodation and um, hypo accommodation in these Down syndrome children? Yes, if, if we've got a minute to do so, let me just yes, share my is. screen again. Uh, here we are. This is um, from one of our um, papers that, that we found 75% uh, of children with Down syndrome under accommodate at near even when their refractive error, particularly hypermetropia, is fully corrected. So this is a colleague's data, typical school age children. The ideal accommodation would be along the diagonal line here. And you can see that typical children, when asked to produce four diopters because they're at 25 centimeters, can do so almost perfectly. Um, tiny, tiny lag at uh, 17 centimeters, and there's an appreciable lag at 10 centimeters because these are school age children up to 18, and it's a bit of a struggle to, to see that close. But at all distances, children with Down syndrome are under accommodating. They do accommodate, and you can see by how much they accommodate um, here, but they do not accommodate enough to get the target clear, um, optically clear. Um, and for that, we use bifocals. And it was lovely to see one of Lavinia's slides showing a child wearing um, bifocals. That, that was really good to see. And so it and there's been other people's work. There's some more recent from the Netherlands um, showing how schoolwork and so on improves in children with Down syndrome when they go into bifocals if they have this accommodative deficit. Uh, obviously a quarter of children don't, they get by with single vision specs or no specs at all, uh, but the ones who have hypoaccommodation uh, do well in all respects in bifocal. So it's very important that we um, measure children's accommodation. I'd just like to throw something else in, if I may. I, this hasn't been tested because it's actually quite difficult to test. But my guess is that children with Down syndrome and low hypermetropia don't accommodate for distance either. I suspect that children with Down syndrome don't bother to overcome hypermetropia. So it may be appropriate to consider prescribing even quite small amounts of hypermetropia that for typical children, we would ignore. Okay, so, so practically- Thanks for allowing me to get that in. Yeah, practically what you're saying is prescribe glasses even if they have plus two 
or plus two and a half as opposed to normal children? Yes, I've, I've prescribed plus one. Plus one even. As low as that, yes. Uh -huh. But I and always check their accommodation. Mm -hmm. okay. okay, and also, and also uh, prescribe by focals if, if you think that it's, it's, it's appropriate. And also yes, yes. Uh, give and give the full amount of hyperopia. Don't cut the plus too much yeah. if even Ab exactly. Absolutely. Okay. Don't give a reduced correction unless it's to ease the child into spec where temporarily. Okay, now that's very important. Okay. So you, you yeah. give glasses yeah. for plus one and, and above. That's very important. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. And we're going to head on to the next uh, speaker, Dr. Liz, Liz Connor. We're going to speak with us about keratoconus in Down syndrome. Please, Liz. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. How's that going? Right, thank you everyone for having me to talk today. It's an absolute pleasure to be here. And today I'm talking about the prevalence and management of keratoconus and Down syndrome. Um, and I've been an, a corny attending in Christchurch and now I'm doing my pediatric ophthalmology fellowship uh, here at UPMC Children's Hospital in Pittsburgh. So my outline for today's talk, I'm gonna be covering what is keratoconus? What is the prevalence of keratoconus in people with Down syndrome? And how are we diagnosing and managing keratoconus in people with Down syndrome? So firstly, keratoconus is a corneal disease and it's characterized by progressive thinning and distortion of the cornea. So as you can see in the photographs here, that's the photo on the right shows a cornea that's becoming conical shaped rather than a nice smooth curve. Um, and that conical shape introduces astigmatism and higher order aberrations, which make visual, uh, vision difficult. And then you can see that that can induce some apical scarring as well, which can just block the vision. So vision loss can be due to those factors, but also in the worst case scenario, the, the stretch on the cornea is so great that this maze membrane can tear, and then you get a water cleft as shown in the OCT at the bottom. And this may be the presenting complaint in a child with developmental delay or Down syndrome, because it's the first time that someone taking care of them can notice um, that their cornea is highly unusual. And when you present with high drops, that's devastating on a child with uh, already has special medical needs and developmental delay because really they've got a red, sore, painful eye, it's watery, they can't see well. And we just have to let time take its course for the resolution of the high drops and hope for the best for their vision in that case. So this is certainly a condition where prevention is much better than a cure. And um, so I'm gonna talk about some of the ways that we can try and prevent keratoconus or prevent it progressing in the talk today. So firstly, the prevalence of keratoconus in the general population, the prevalence of keratoconus is actually difficult to pin down because it turns out that there's wide geographic and environmental differences. And so when you look at it, the surveys across the world, it ranges from 0.2 to 4,790 per 100,000. And while it's often quoted as being one per 2,000, I think the take home message really is you need to know what your local prevalence is in the general population to perhaps get an idea of what the prevalence might be in the Down syndrome population that you're working with um, in your group. So that said, the, all the studies that have looked at the prevalence of keratoconus in the Down syndrome population have shown a significantly higher rate. And there's probably a large number of children and young adults with Down syndrome for whom mm -hmm. keratoconus is undiagnosed. So one study in Norway showed about 30 times the general population rate. And in an ophthalmology clinic for Down syndrome patients in Brazil, about 27% had keratoconus. So it's certainly a diagnosis that we don't want to be missing because the prevention is better than the cure. And it's likely there's a higher prevalence rate in the Down syndrome population. So within people with Down syndrome, is there a predisposition for keratoconus? To start with, it turns out that their corneal changes of thinner corneal pachymetry, higher rates of astigmatism, and steeper corneal curvature at baseline may mean that when they develop keratoconus, there's less reserve. And so they progress more rapidly and present with more advanced keratoconus when we see them. We know that there's increased 
rates of obstructive sleep apnea and floppy eyelids in people with Down syndrome. And whether this whether these factors are caused by a change in the collagen um, or a low tone, giving you both obstructive sleep apnea or floppy eyelids, there's also some evidence that if you have obstructive sleep apnea, the relative hypoxia overnight predisposes you to developing floppy eyelids. People with Down syndrome also have higher rates of atopy, allergy, and blepharitis. So that makes the eyes itchy and that then triggers the eye rubbing. And the other thing that triggers eye rubbing is blurred vision. So correcting um, refractive error can help reduce eye rubbing. So why is eye rubbing such a big problem? And it's because when you really get in there and rub your eyes, it causes mechanical stress. So if you've already got a weakened cornea because of your underlying condition um, and predisposition to keratoconus, and then you get in there and rub the eye, you're obviously causing a lot of mechanical stress. That also um, ruptures the mast cells, which release more inflammatory mediators, making your trigger for eye rubbing worse and potentially exacerbating uh, the corneal changes. And then also it actually increases the intraocular pressure, can be up to 100 times. So all of the factors of eye rubbing depend on how vigorously you're rubbing your eyes and how frequently you're doing it. So to diagnose keratoconus, I mean, ideally we'd like to diagnose it before high drops, but if somebody presents with high drops, you can know that they've got keratoconus and you want to look very closely at the other eye and then hopefully treat it early. There are some classic early signs of keratoconus, such as a scissoring reflex or an oil droplet sign that you can actually see from across the room. You don't need any special equipment. You don't even need to be able to get so close to a child with a developmental delay if they're not letting you examine them to see those things. Um, and then we've got lots of technology which can help. Um, and the corneal tomography can be quite difficult to get, um, but you don't need a perfect scan to help give you information. And then there's other tools that we can use as well. Some of these things can be used intraoperatively. So for example, here we've got integrated OCT. You can really see the change in the shape of the cornea. Uh, this could be done in a clinic in OCT as well. And also handheld topography can be done um, when the child's asleep. So really, um, probably a big take home message for everyone today is uh, children with Down syndrome and particularly children with Down syndrome and allergies or sore red eyes should really see um, an ophthalmologist who's expert for looking for keratoconus uh, and who can also help manage the triggers by rubbing. So we really want to have good allergy management. We want to be aggressive about making the eyes comfortable. We want to treat blepharitis and demodex if it's there. Um, and then making sure that they've got good refractive correction and that's not a trigger for their eye rubbing. <clears throat> in terms of treating keratoconus, if they present with high drops, that's a difficult situation. There's a lot of discussion about whether you should use um, saline drops, steroids, lower the pressure inside the eye, um, but you can also do a temporary tarsorophy for comfort, just leave the eye closed for three days. Uh, and often that's the fastest way to resolve an episode of high drops, but putting the tarsorophy in may be some difficult. And so then before scouring occurs, you can go for glasses, RGP lenses, up to 75% of people in the general population will get their best vision, they have keratoconus with an RGP lens, but these obviously can be difficult to fit in someone with Down syndrome. Um, and then intact um, is often difficult in people with Down syndrome because the corneas are too thin to put the intact in lays in. And then after scouring occurs, we're left with uh, corneal grafts, which have a number of complications, which can all be more difficult. Um, in people with developmental delay and, delay and other medical needs. And so then we get to cross-linking. Mm -hmm. And in cross-linking, um, the Dresden protocol was described in about 1994. The cornea must be over 400 microns. And then we take the epithelium off, we soak the cornea in riboflavin, and then we shine the UV light on, and that induces cross-linking, which makes the cornea stronger. <laughs> so at UPMC, we do this as a same-day procedure. We do a general anesthesia, apply paralysis so that we get the best result and the most amount of UV light exactly where we want it. We use the standard protocol and close the eye with a central temporary tarsorophy afterwards, and that just helps with pain control and management afterwards. You really have to warn the parents that they're in for two or three days of, uh, for most children or young adults, a miserable sore eye, um, but it's really worth the long-term gains to have to do it this way. There's um, people are working on trying to leave the epithelium on when you do cross-linking and doing faster procedures. Um, but at this stage, the most robust long-term evidence and a once-and-done 
kind of approach I'm trying to get cross-linking in is to use the standard dressed in protocol. And so then finally, there's this big question of whether you should wait for cross-linking. <clears throat> and in the general population, you might wait to see progression, progression before submitting them to a procedure. But often in younger people and people with Down syndrome, if they've got clear signs of keratoconus, they've got a large number of years at risk, uh, and we know that they tend to progress more quickly and more aggressively. And so if you wait, you may find that they present then with high drops or with worsened keratoconus by the time you cross-link them. So it's really worth considering once you make the diagnosis, just booking them for cross-linking. After you've cross-linked them, they still need annual review. They're likely to under-report symptoms if things are getting worse. Uh, so you want a good ophthalmologic exam and you want to continuously manage the allergy because if they continue to rub their eyes, they're much more likely to progress. That's all, thank you very much. Okay, hey, um, thank you, Elizabeth. Um, the next speaker is going to be Ramesh. He's going to talk about strabismus and Down syndrome. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, strabismus and Down syndrome specifically. Do you see what I see? I mean, there is a specific strabismus entity. Do you see the similar pattern? So I'm going to share some of the experience what I had with the strabismus. If you look at the prevalence and the type of strabismus, pseudoesotopia also is seen in uh, patients with uh, Down syndrome with the typical features, epicanthal folds. With the true strabismus, the prevalence uh, in different studies it varies between 25 to 40 percent. Out of that, if you look at the esotropia, is very, very common. I'm sure all the panelists will agree. Uh, but rarely we see exotropia and uh, vertical strabismus as well. I've written post uh, surgical strabismus. It's sometimes seen in patients with uh, cataract surgery or other corneal surgery. Nystagmus, again, uh, in some of the countries, it's uh, quite uh, common, and in some places, it's not so. Probably, it's a low detection or no eye movement recording is not there. We don't know the reason, but that's, uh, that's something to watch in these patients. Having said that, the accommodation insufficiency we spoke about, they can have accommodation insufficiency with near vision issues, or they can have it even without near vision issue. So both ways it's possible. It's a busy table, but I just wanted to look at, this is a, a world uh, webinar, worldwide webinar. I just wanted to look at uh, each of this about the strabismus. If you look at US, it varies around 21%. You can see two, three studies there. And the nystagmus is pretty low, 3.5%. Similar trend of strabismus, 44% in Europe. Uh, but if you look at the largest study, the nystagmus is around 2 to 6%. Uh, in Asia, it's 25%. Nystagmus is quite, uh, quite highly prevalent if you compare. And uh, similar uh, in other parts of Asia as well as 26% and 33%. And in the Middle East, uh, it varies uh, 14 to 23% and then nystagmus also. What is peculiar, this is one of the paper from Africa, Adidio Adio has uh, written, her group has written, the strabismus and even the nystagmus is a little bit low. So this is the uh, worldwide impact about the strabismus and other ophthalmological disorders you see in patients with Down syndrome. Glasses, we have emphasized a lot, Sometimes it can correct the strabismus. Uh, it's so simple to correct it in some of the patients. And some of the patients, you might have to do uh, surgery. When you talk about surgery in Down syndrome, the most important question everybody have in their mind is what is the surgical dose? Again, there are uh, different studies have been done. I'm going to show just two slides just to get a feeling what is happening around the world. If you look at, uh, there are some columns which I'll highlight. 
But the surgery is almost bilateral medial rectus recession. In all of this, I'm going to share the highlight of 12 studies. You can see the bilateral that shows that esotropia is so, so common. And all of them has been uh, published in the last decade. You can see that in that uh, column. And obviously, all of them are retrospective. Numbers ranges from 15 to 78. And if you look at the uh, surgical success rate, it varies between 50 to 85%. Quite good success without any kind of undercorrection. I, I want you to look at the last aspect. Most of the patients published in th this group is around four or five years. The mean age is that. That gives you when to operate and what is the trend people operate on strabismus in Down syndrome. This is again a continuation of the same thing. Again, the surgery is bilateral medial rectus recession. All are retrospective studies. Again, happened in the last one or one and a half decades, except two studies, which were of 94 or 95. And uh, you can see the numbers are a little bit more here. Uh, some of the studies had 94%. They also has a control of typically developing patients. When you compare them with the typically uh, developed patients, success rate is somewhere lying. If you look at the average, it's around 70 to 80. So what does it say? All these studies is that normal surgical dose gives a good results in terms of esotropia, which is the most common strabismus, what you see in this group. So is an altered surgical dose required in Down syndrome? Probably, uh, uh, even uh, our experience, personal experience, and also the published one does not support reducing the surgical dose, except in patients with developmental delay, or if the same Down syndrome patients have CVI, then you might see the exaggerated surgical effect when you need to reduce the surgical dose. This is about the typical strabismus, what you see. I just want to share in the next two to three slides about the prevalence of abnormal head posture in patients with Down syndrome, which is uh, quite common as well. In this study of 259 patients, 24% of them had abnormal head posture, reason being incompetent strabismus, nystagmus, and in 19%, no definitive uh, causation was uh, seen. If you look at this child, you can see a large right head tilt. Look at what he has in the primary position, a large esotropia. If you look at the head tilt picture, the esotropia disappears. This is the esotropia dependent uh, abnormal head posture. Uh, Greg Luder and his colleagues have published, there are, I believe uh, there are six cases on the similar thing, head tilt dependent esotropia associated trisomy 29, 21. You can see that this child has a typical left head tilt, but in the primary position, a large esotropia. This patient in the infancy had a microtropia, microisotropia, but with the head tilt, as the child grows, you can see that uh, esotropia is becoming more. And this child also similar with the large esotropia. But these patients, most of them responded to a typical bilateral medial rectus recession. Having said that, some of these patients, you can look at this patient, esotropia is still there on the child when the child is tilting to the right. You can see the tilt can be variable, but very classically, when you occlude one eye, the tilt goes. You can see in all of these pictures, either your patch, you can see the disappearance of the abnormal head posture. So uh, again, one more patient with the large esotopia here, child has the left tilt. This child, if you see carefully, the child also has DVD. Why am I showing all these uh, characteristics is there are different causes of abnormal head posture in these patients. When you look at their fundus, as you see in this patient, there is no torsional changes. And if somebody can ask, do they have any abnormality of the placement or heterotopy of the muscles? Probably not. We don't 
image in all of the patient, but wherever we have imaged, we haven't found any kind of changes. So head tilt, bilateral medial rectus recession typically corrects in most of the patients, as you can see in this patient. This is a esotropia dependent abnormal head posture. This patient, we had to do a bilateral medial rectus recession with vertical shift. What is the deciding factor between bilateral medial rectus recession alone versus vertical shift of the horizontal rectus muscle is if they have esotropia even on tilt, then you need to do a combined procedure. That's what we have done here. You can see that still at the last follow up, the child has a little bit of esotropia. And the last part is, uh, you know, they can have cataract, post cataract, they can develop strabismus. All of us know that post cataract surgery, esotropia can be developed. I just wanted to summarize related to strabismus. Strabismus and also nystagmus is a common entity in Down syndrome patient. Head tilt is particularly peculiar here. It can be esotropia dependent. It can be associated with DVD, nystagmus, incommitant strabismus. Very rarely, it can be idiopathic and it can also happen after any post cataract surgery or other surgery. Esotropia, we know that it responds to normal surgical doses. Thank you so much uh, for all the attention. Thank you so much, Ramesh, for this uh, talk. A very interesting. Could you just elaborate what kind of vertical shift are you doing in these patients? We are really very hard, to, very difficult to manage. I had also a few patients like that. It's really, really very hard to manage the head tilt. Yeah, uh, Yair, uh, when I see this, uh, I look for two things. I look for any nystagmus, even if it is micro nystagmus or DVD then my approach is different if they have. If they don't have anything, I see the child in primary position and that the child has esotropia. Even when they tilt, they still persist with the esotropia. You are asking in that particular situation, what is my approach? I do a normal medial rectus recession for the surgical uh, angle, whatever we see. And if the child has a right head tilt, Simplest thing uh, I tell my fellows and even I follow is raise the right-sided muscle. If somebody has a right head tilt, raise the right lateral rectus and the left medial rectus and downshift the right medial rectus and the left lateral rectus. So right side head, raise the right-sided muscle. That's the approach I use. I'm not uh, getting 100% uh, result, but parents, and I'm happy at least uh, 85 to 90 percent. It's not that I have uh, hundreds of patients like this. As you know, uh, this is a rare syndrome, and strabismus happens in 22 to 40 percent of the patients. AHB mm -hmm. can happen in one fourth of the strabismus patients. So I would have done a dozen of patients. That's my experience in this kind of patients. So just to clarify, you raise the lateral rectus without resecting or recessing it, just raising it up and recess the medial and also raising it in the in the lower eye. Right. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so we've got quite a lot of questions uh, for the panel. So. There's quite a lot of questions on the accommodation and this Down syndrome. So maybe we could have a discussion on that. Um, uh, in particular to Maggie, um, the audience would like to know, would a label kind of accommodated system cause difficulty in uneven ground or stairs? And after that, um, there are some questions both to Lavinia and Liz on like, if you cannot measure the, and also Maggie, if you cannot, measure the accommodation in these kids what are the tests do you do or do you just give the bifocals and also maybe Kishaw can comment on whether he has seen any difference after these kids were given glasses so, so maybe first <laughs> yeah <laughs> right, do, you want, do you want me to come in there yes um the question was would accommodative difficulties cause uh, difficulties with uneven, uneven. ground 
In our cohort, those 81 children who answered those CV questions, we also had optometric data on all of them. And there was no association between any of the CV symptoms and their accommodation or their visual acuity or their refractive error so that it wasn't associated at all with any optometric features. And, and what, what kind of, of bifocals do you prescribe in these children? Executive or other? It, flat topped DSEG, exactly what the child in Lavinia's slide was wearing. Um, the, oh, there are various types and cost has to come into it, depending on what sort of, uh, you know, sort of health system we have in different countries. Um, but flat top is easiest because optically it's better and the child can just drop their eyes a fraction and find it. So it's important to fit the bifocals high. Otherwise the children don't make use of it. If they've got to drop their eyes too far, they don't make use of it. So a flat top bifocal fitted high, we find is best. Mm -hmm. And I've forgotten what the other questions were. So like if, you can't if you can't measure the accommodation, do you just prescribe the bifocals or do you, if you, you, there's, or do you have any other way to try to estimate the accommodation? Oh, and, right. And also, I, what, I, and also what, what is the addition that you give if there's no strabismus? What is the addition that you... Like, how do you, how do you, yeah. Right. How do you decide how much to I, Now, what some people do is measure the accommodation with dynamic ret uh -huh. and give a bifocal ad appropriate to the under accommodation. Mm -hmm. Okay. What we do is give everybody plus 250. Okay. And we find that works. The, the only time I would change that is if I had a particularly tall child with long arms who had a further working distance. Okay than okay. most of the children. Uh, but generally, we just give them all plus 250. Um, dynamic ret takes seconds. So there aren't any children that I can't measure accommodation with unless it's a child that I can't measure anything with. You know, there, there, there would be no alternative if it was a child that I couldn't do dynamic rec with. What about... You can't measure the accommodation, just give plus 250. Okay. Sorry, can you repeat that, Yaya? Yeah, yeah. If you don't, if you're not able to measure the accommodation, just give plus 250. Yes, yes, that's Addition. what I would do anyway, if I'm okay. going to, yeah. What about Lavinia or Liz, what do you do? like for the, for the accommodative, uh, hyper-accommodation. Lavinia, you're, you're yeah. muted. Yeah. So, yeah, my top is with dynamic accommodation and we give uh, an addition of plus three. Uh, I also pay attention for the isotropia when the isotropia it's getting better with a, a plus three addition, I will give it anyway, even if the accommodation seems well. And sometimes we can also, in some cases, try a near visual test and ask the child if it's better, if it's comfortable. And what I wanted to mention, I tried from, uh, for some big adolescents, um, multifocal glasses with an good optician, the same one that he did the bifocals and he's aware to put the near um, part higher. And in some three, four cases that they didn't want the line anymore and uh, they are happy with it and they seems to use the lower part. Yeah. Yeah, we do much the same. Sorry. sorry, sorry, go, go ahead, Liz. I was, I was just going to say, we do match the same. We do the bifocal ads with the large D segment and the flat top. 
for most children. And then if they're using that really well and they wanted to change to progressive later, you'd consider it later. So, and Kishore, 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 yeah, have you seen any difference when they come with the glasses? Any difference in their in that behavior? I, I think um, the the challenge that we run into is making sure that the parents are are on board with the with the importance of wearing the glasses to to manage the the esotropia. I think uh, uh, when they when they are able to get the children to wear the glasses effectively, of course, yes, we we do definitely see uh, improvement and and perhaps even saving uh, surgery and things of that nature. But um, patching wearing the glasses these are very difficult things for a lot of the kids they have a lot of facial sensitivities and so it can be uh, it can be a real struggle so but yeah if they wear it i definitely have seen improvement um, has what anyone about... in the panel, sorry has anyone in the panel used uh, prk or uh, laser surgery for for children that does not wear glasses whenever they, they just don't get the glasses do you have any uh, experience with that. Okay. Not really. I had a question for Kishore, like um, for is, when we need to use atropine eye drops for Down syndrome kids, should we be, um, how, how concerned should we be? And uh, what are the take home messages for that? Yeah, I think most of the time making sure anytime we're going to start any type of potentially systemically absorbed that could have an impact on the heart is just to make sure with their cardiologist that everything is cleared from their perspective. But the amount that gets absorbed from the ocular absorption, I'm sure would be so minimal that if the child has already a, either a corrected or no cardiac concerns, cardiac conduction concerns, I don't know that it would make uh, be too, too concerning. But always a, an easy message if they have a cardiologist to send uh, to make sure they don't have any concerns as well. Um, we have um, some questions from Ramesh. Um, why does strabismus occur after the cataract surgery? And um, do you see patients with Down syndrome and exotropia and any comments on that? Yeah, the first question, why it happens after cataract surgery? Uh, maybe four to five reasons. Uh, number one, uh, they would have had a pre-existing small strabismus, which can get decompensated specifically when they have nystagmus, they can lose accommodation more once you take out the lens, or they might have to add a little bit more of accommodation. That's the second reason I would say. And sometimes uh, they can develop, there will be a competition between the two eyes, competition between the two eyes. It can happen, uh, especially in some of the centers, they take one month or two months between the two cataract surgery. So there could be a competition happening. There could be a competition due to complication in one of the eyes because post-operatively you can have a competition, uh, you know, membrane development or any kind of uh, complication happens that can lead to. And uh, the last thing I would say is some of these Down syndrome uh, cases and children, they can have a cataract in one eye. When you take out these lenses, again, they can develop. So I would say six to seven reasons uh, why do they develop. And the second question about exotropia, it's pretty rare. Uh, uh, I've seen in some of the videos of the parents, I do attend some of the uh, conferences uh, kind of arranged by the parents. I see a lot of, uh, not a lot, very minute amount of uh, exotropia patients. Uh, believe it or not, I've never seen an exotropia duan uh, exotropia case till now, personally in the clinic. But when I go, uh, I've seen multiple videos. I see many of the kids have also. Personally, I've seen not seen. It's quite rare. I, I don't know other, maybe Yair sees a lot. What is your experience? No, I don't know. It's, it's maybe Dr. Velody, uh, I don't know how many he sees in his clinic because he will have a lot of other patients. No, yeah, we, have, we have about 600 or so pediatric patients per year that we see. It, you're right, it's very rare. The exotropia is, uh, is much, much less common than, than esotropia for sure. 
If I could ask one question, uh, Dr. Ramesh, the, when you have the abnormal head posturing, but there is no strabismus reason for it, I often think that it's some sort of sensory. They like to kind of look at the world from a different perspective, but some of the families get very, very um, worried about it. And we make sure there's nothing wrong at lanoaxial or anything like that. But what do you do when they have a head posturing, but there's you don't see any strabismus there in a segment to, to account for it? Yeah, I I do see in uh, you know typical uh, developed uh, children as well as this kind of uh, babies. Uh, if they don't have strabismus, no nystagmus, no dissociated vertical deviation, I would uh, not. I would obviously occlude one eye and see, uh, rule out all the orthopedic causes. What I do, uh, I don't know what my success rate in these patients is. Pair of glasses makes them better. And uh, it, I, I don't know whether it's sensory. I don't know the hypothesis why they really develop. They don't have any kind of ear infection. I just make sure I rule out everything and I just uh, tell the parents, just wait for some time. This all happens once you ruled out nystagmus, strabismus, and dissociated vertical deviation. So I, I would go very slow on them. I reassure the patients, nothing is wrong. Uh, I, would, uh, I would wait. And uh, most often uh, it gets corrected. I have... Uh, Three children with that kind of situation at uh, infancy or toddler toddler stage, because this manifestation is not seen in infants. It uh, it happens when they st start to say it, then you will see this. <clears throat> they become better over a period of time. I just reassure. Thank you. Okay, thank Maggie, you. Maggie, had a question as well, Maggie, to one of the participants. You said before, <clears throat> Maggie. Sorry, did you say I can ask my question yeah, of Liz now? <laughs> Liz, um, when Kishore was doing his uh, presentation, he showed the uh, healthcare guidelines for the US, which stated after the age of 13, eye examinations every three years. In the light of keratoconus, what's your opinion of that? And what do you think it should be changed to? Yeah, well, certainly I think with a lot of the information we're gathering now, there's, there's more papers that are suggesting we should be screening for keratoconus more frequently in people with Down syndrome. And the good questions would, I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have an intervention. So the screening didn't matter. If we found keratoconus, we gave them glasses. So because of the new technology of cross-linking where we can intervene early, you know, maybe that is something we need to change in the guidelines, uh, at least optometry review annually through those 10 years to early 20s. Um, and I would certainly strongly recommend any child or young adult with allergy who's eye rubbing, which may be most of the children with um, Down syndrome. Uh, well, to be fair, actually, lots of them don't rub their eyes, but they have a bit of allergy. But if they are eye rubbers and they've got allergy, they should certainly, I would recommend an ophthalmologist exam every year. If nothing else, just to get their eyes comfortable, because it'd be pretty miserable to live with itchy eyes all the time. We know it drives adults crazy. So just because they're not complaining about it doesn't mean that it's not bothering all quality of their life, you know, quality aspects of their life. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. And thank you, Liz. So I think we have to wrap up now. So I would just like um, to thank the panel and, and ask each of the panel to give our audience one like kind of final comment, one final take home message. Maybe we can go around like Kishore, would you like to start first? Like one, you know, one last pearl. Oh, wow. That's uh, <laughs> one last pearl. Just um, the most important one. Yeah, I think uh, most importantly is uh, that we we recognize that people with Down syndrome are, are people uh, first, and they uh, uh, require the same level of thought process and and, uh, and time uh, with those uh, challenging times when we're trying to get them to do things they don't want to do. That we would have patience and in working with them and with their families. Thank you, thank you, and Maggie, you have to unmute. Muted, right. I'd just like to emphasize the importance of regular eye exams for life in Down syndrome. Let's get it all put right. Thank you. Lavinia? Oh, uh, well, 
um, maybe encouraging to wear the glasses uh, since a young age, since uh, we see for the first year of life, start with the glasses if they have refractive errors and encourage them to progressively uh, raise the wear of the glasses. Yeah. Liz? Uh, yeah, there's a lot of new treatments for allergic eye disease. So be mindful of red, watery, sore eyes and treat them would be my take home because anyone can do that. And Ramesh? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I, I just uh, say that uh, these uh, special babies, they need uh, treatment for everything. So closely work with the parents and the pediatrician. For a pediatrician and a parent, there are at least 20 systems to check. We are talking about eye and don't overburden with a lot of referrals. I think customize referral and make minimal wherever. It's not so easy to achieve, but that's where uh, I think we should proceed. I would say awareness and customized referral. Right, thank you so much. So um, um, we have some closing announcements. Yes, uh, also I, I'm, I'm aware that maybe some of you had had questions that did, they were not answered, so please, if you have any questions that you need to get an answer for, email them to admin at, that, at uh, wspos.org and we'll respond to these questions in the one or two days from now. And other, the, <coughs> stay tuned for our uh, webinar tomorrow. Tomorrow is a very important and new uh, kind of webinar for parents and families. Uh, how do I deal with my uh, child with Down syndrome? Please tell your patient's parents about this webinar. It will be tomorrow at the same time as today. And hopefully uh, there will be some experts that you can uh, ask questions and get some advice about your children. And our next uh, webinar is the Dissociated Distributions Complex uh, at April 23rd and the John WGA WS webinar, WSPOS webinar on May 21st, uh, upcoming webinars, and some new things that you should know if you're a member of the WSPOS. And if you're not a member, just join today because <clears throat> we have some new uh, uh, and important things to tell you. First of all, WSPOS has joined with Ophthalmic Research Journal uh, to give all members a significantly reduced article processing charge for the members. Also, WSPRS uh, has joined with the Journal of Binocular Vision and Ocular Motility, and all members will have access to one issue of the journal per year for free. So since membership is free, don't hesitate and join today. You can enjoy the library of online educational video, video, uh, videos and stay up to date with the, the uh, webinars that we have in other future events. And you can also join our Facebook page and group and subscribe to the YouTube channel. And of course, you have the list trails which is run by Dr. David Granite from WSPOS. So here's the, you have on the, on the slide here, how to contact him and how to get into the listserv. I, I, I've been on this listserv for like more than 20 years. It's amazing. It, you can always have good answers and smart answers for the patients that you don't know how to deal with. And uh, thank you. Thank you all our audience, uh, Shaolay. Yeah, so Thanks. special thanks to the, our audience from all over the world. We had people from Australia staying way past their bedtime, Canada, Africa, Argentina, Brazil, Saudi Arabia, Serbia, Barbados, Spain, and um, a lot of parts of Africa. Thank you again, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. It's yeah, we stopped. Offline. Right? We're offline, right? <laughs> it's just recording at the top, I think. I think we're offline. Are we offline?